Indy Semiconductor grew its revenue in triple digits in the past four to five quarters on an average and therefore there's a lot of hype surrounding this stock. In this video, I'm going to talk about whether Indy Semiconductor is a 10x opportunity or speculative investment. In doing so, I will cover its business model, then I will cover its financials and finally I'll do a valuation to show the upside. Let's first look at Indy's business model. Indy Semiconductor provides automotive semiconductors and software solutions for advanced driver assistance systems, autonomous vehicle, in-cabin connected car and electrification applications in the US, South America, rest of the uh, North America, Greater China, rest of Asia Pacific and Europe. So they are present around the world and they offer ultrasonic sensors for parking assistance systems, radar sensors for audio assistance and reverse information, front cameras for vehicle detection, collision avoidance and sign reading, etc. So you get the idea of Indy Semiconductor. They are an automotive semiconductor and software solutions company. Let's look at their technology. As you can see on the screen, they have organic and inorganic. When I say inorganic, they acquired several companies to get that technology. Indy started with Auto PMIC for Apple CarPlay and as the years progressed since 2007, they made high-speed communications, embedded systems, vehicle bus communications, they have wireless charging. In addition, they also got into LiDAR, radar and even computer vision applications by acquisition. But we do know that these technologies are critical for autonomous driving. Let's discuss a bit more about their business. They're capitalizing on three strategic auto mega trends. The first one is the advanced driver assistance systems in which they have the LiDAR, radar and even the computer vision technologies. Then they have the second trend, which is in-cabin user experience. We do know they do provide wireless charging and they're also associated with Apple CarPlay and they also do the cabin lighting. So that's the in-cabin user experience. And the third trend that they are capitalizing on is electrification. Specifically in the electrification, their opportunities are charging controllers, diagnostic solutions and e-fuse chips. Let's look at their radar acquisitions. They acquired the radar division of ON Semi, and then they also acquired the radar division of analog devices. And finally, they also acquired silicon radar. Obviously, these acquisitions cost them money, so their balance sheet did get affected by this, and we will look into that when we go over the financials. We do know that autonomous driving also involves computer vision, so they also acquired another company, Geo Semiconductor, that is associated with computer vision and they already have existing clients. A lot of automotive companies are already their clients. So what is the opportunity for Indy? So this is the slide that they have shown in their investor presentation. Currently there is about $700 worth of auto semiconductors that are in Indy's scope. But they are saying that in future it could get to $1,100 per vehicle or if it's a luxury car, it could even get to $7,000 per vehicle. So they're saying that this opportunity is increasing significantly. And they have another slide that they have shown that the compounded annual growth for the sector is about 11%. So enough with the business model. Now let's move on to the financials. At $6.35, its market cap is about $972 million. The past 12 months, they made close to $155 million of revenue. So that's a price to sales of about six, which is not expensive. At the same time, they're growing their revenue rapidly, right? So this price to sales ratio is going to go to about four by the end of this year. So with respect to the price to sales, this is not expensive. When you look into the net income, it's negative $135 million. So that's a significant loss for a revenue of $155 million. Let's look at how they have performed in the most recent quarter. In Q2, they made a revenue of about $52 million and that represents 102% year over year growth, which is triple digit. And even for Q3 of 2023, next quarter, they're saying they can achieve 100% year over year growth to make about $60 million. So that is also impressive, triple digit revenue growth. 
one thing that they are saying is that they have reiterated their plan to reach non-GAAP operating income in Q4 and more than double revenue in 2023. When I see non-GAAP operating income, uh, I don't get very excited because it's non-GAAP. Let's now look at their income statement to get an idea of their gross margins, net margins, and how their business is performing. As you can see on the screen, in the most recent quarter, their total revenue was about $52 million. They did not show us the gross profit, but based on the cost of goods sold, I get a 38% gross margin, which is good, but it's not great. Also, I want to point out that there are a lot of competitors for Indy Semiconductors. You can do a quick Google search and you'll find a lot of them. Let's look at the operating expenses. They're close to $60 million, $42 million in research and development, and there is selling general and administrative of about $18 million. So that's about $60 million of operating expenses. Therefore, their loss from operations is $40 million. When you look into the net loss or net income, it's about $13 million. So how did they go from $40 million of operating loss to only $13 million of operating loss? That's due to one line item, which said gain from change in fair value of warrants. That's $25 million. So that's not a recurrent uh, item. So because of that number, the net income seems a bit less than what it actually should have been. But the idea here is that they still have significant operating expenses and they are still nowhere close to gap profitability. Let's look into the number of outstanding shares. A year ago, they had 116 million. And this year, they have close to 141 million. That's close to 20% dilution. Let's quickly look at Indy's balance sheet. They have close to $180 million of cash and cash equivalents. A year ago, that number was $320 million. So they consumed $140 million of cash in one year. Also, when you look at their long-term debt, that's about $156 million. So it's very close to the current cash and cash equivalent. So I cannot give too much credit to their cash in hand. Before I move on to the valuation, I want to give you an idea of what it takes for Indy Semiconductor to become gap operating profitable. For that, they have to make close to $150 million of quarterly revenue. Currently, they made $50 million, right? And next quarter, they're saying $60 million, but they have to get to $150 million, which is so far away in future. If they make a quarterly revenue of $150 million, as I said before, their gross margin is 38%, right? So their gross profit would be $60 million out of this $150 million of revenue. Their current operating expenses are $60 million. And as they grow bigger and bigger, those operating expenses will have to increase. But I'm being very optimistic here. And I'm saying that the operating expenses will not increase in time. So even in that case, for them to break even, this company has to make $150 million of quarterly revenue which is so far away into the future and not increase its operating expenses and keep them at $60 million. So for me, gap profitability seems like far, far away into the future. Now let's look into the valuation. As usual, I'm going to show two cases, one with reasonable assumptions and the other one with great execution. And before I show you the numbers, I want to clarify that this is not financial advice. I'm not qualified to give financial advice. I'm simply recording my thoughts about Indy Semiconductors. Let's look at the valuation with reasonable assumptions. In 2023, they're on track to get about $220 million of revenue. The estimated growth rate I put as 30% because right now they're growing at about 100% year over year. But as they grow bigger and bigger, it's very hard to grow. So for the next four years, I'm only saying that they can get to 30% year over year on an average growth. With that, they can make close to $630 million of revenue in 2027. Remember that it's one thing to grow from 20 to 40 million and 40 to 80 and 80 to 160, right? So as the company gets bigger and bigger, it's hard for them to grow. 
With respect to the net profit margins, I'm assuming 15%, which I think is reasonable based on their gross margin of 38%. This is still a small company, it's still a growing company. So 15% net profit margin is reasonable for me. With that, they can make close to $90 million of net income in 2027. I'm assigning a premium multiple of 27.5. You can assign more if you think it's appropriate, but 27.5 I think is reasonable. With that, this company's market cap in 2027 would be about $2.59 billion. With respect to the number of outstanding shares, we do know they diluted the shareholders by 20% in the past one year. They're nowhere near profitability, so they will continue to dilute the shareholders. I'm only assuming 7.5% dilution year over year on an average for the next four years with that they will have close to 188 million outstanding shares in 2027 when i divide the 2.59 billion dollars of market cap with 188 million outstanding shares i get a stock price of 14 dollars currently they're at 6.35 dollars right so that's about 117 percent gain which is very attractive let me show you the great execution case I'm assuming 40% year over year growth with which they'll make $850 million of revenue in 2027. That's close to a billion dollars, right? With respect to net profit margin, I'm assuming that as they grow bigger and bigger, they'll optimize their operating expenses and get to 20% net profit margin. In the investor presentation, they're saying they want to get to 60% gross margins and 30% operating margins, but I don't believe them yet. Uh, because they have a lot of competition and there's nothing special in what they're doing. As far as my research is concerned, at least that's what I understand. So 20% net profit margin is a result of great execution. Again, I'm not buying into their 60% gross margin target and 30% operating margin target until they show me the results. So with that, they will make close to $170 million of net income in 2027. I'm assigning a premium multiple of 35 with which this company would be worth about $6 billion in 2027. I'm keeping the dilution same, 7.5% on an average year over year dilution. With that, the stock price in 2027 would be about $31. Currently, the stock is at $6.35, right? So that's about 395% gain or 5x in the next four and a half years. So in conclusion, I'm seeing 117% gain in the base case with reasonable assumptions and in the great execution case i'm seeing a 5x return in four and a half years which is an excellent gain for my personal journey i take into consideration the reasonable assumptions case in which i am looking at 117 percent gain which is actually a really good gain but there is a lot of assumption built into this i'm assuming that they can get to 30 percent year over year growth rate which may or may not happen I'm assuming that they can get to 15% net profit margins, which may not happen. There's a lot of competition. They're showing that the industry is growing, but it may not grow as fast as they are saying. And even if it grows as fast as they are saying, we don't know whether they can capture market share from their competitors because they have a lot of competition. And I'm also giving it a premium multiple. It may not happen when the market finds out that this company has no clear differentiator from its competition. So there's a lot of assumptions built into this and I would categorize this as a speculative opportunity. And when there is a speculative opportunity, I want a higher return because I'm taking more risk. When I look into speculative opportunity, I need a higher gain to take that risk. And for me, 117% is not enough for the kind of risk that I am taking. So I would be interested in this stock if it gets to $4 or below. Uh, I would consider buying this stock if it gets there. If it doesn't, it's fine. I'm going to stay on the sidelines. There is a lot of uncertainty in this investment. So for my personal journey, I'm going to stay far, far away from indie semiconductors. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you so much for watching.